I am really excited for our next speaker. I have not actually heard him speak, but many of my colleagues already have, and I, I told them that I really wanted to get him here for one of our events. Um, obviously, you guys heard kind of a more political speech this morning from Congressman Walsh. You've heard a lot of kind of policy uh, talks in there in the panels. Uh, our next one is going to be more of a kind of philosophical, what, you know, our founding fathers and, and why, why do we fight the fights that we do, kind of giving it a historical uh, context to the, you know, the, the fight for freedom and, and liberty. Uh, his, uh, so our speaker for that is a professor of history from the U.S. Military Ca Academy, Robert McDonald. His uh, speech today is entitled The Revolution of Liberty. Yes, please. Well, it is great to be here. Um, first of all, in this uh, fantastic city. Um, second of all, uh, under the, uh, the auspices of the, the Heartland Institute. Um, it's also exciting to, to be here to talk to you about the American Revolution. Um, people will debate uh, U.S. history, education, and, and uh, what students should learn. You oftentimes hear about different state standards. Um, but this, I think, is the essence of it. This is the essence of who we are. Um, America is a nation that's unlike any other nation. Um, I, I, I have respect and high regard for, for, for different nations around the planet. Um, but, you know, Ireland, for example, just kind of emer emerged from the mist of time. Uh, Germany, uh, the, the same. China, the same. These are nations that are based on ethnicity. America is different. America is a nation that's based on a set of ideas. You know, how do you become an American? I'm it. I'm, I'm in. I'm an American. I assent to these principles. And the principles of the American Revolution are a story well worth telling. And it's probably uh, best to begin by telling you that we really were unlikely revolutionaries. Uh, the people of colonial British America um, already had a revolution in 1688, uh, a revolution that we shared with our cousins across the Atlantic Ocean, the Glorious Revolution, which uh, deposed King James II and brought into power William and Mary, monarchs that agreed to uh, rule with Parliament uh, to be limited monarchs, to be part of Britain's balanced constitution. They weren't absolute monarchs like you might find in France or in Spain at the time. Uh, Britain was a nation that was devoted to liberty. In fact, uh, it was a nation that was so devoted to liberty that as late as 1764, no one less than John Adams described the British Constitution as the most perfect combination of human powers in society which finite wisdom has yet contrived and reduced to practice for the preservation of liberty and the production of happiness. But it's, it's probably worth saying that the, uh, the British, they were reluctant revolutionaries too in 1688. Um, it's, it's, I suppose, wrong to generalize about groups of people um, but I'm going to do so anyway, and I, I hope you'll indulge me. Um, I'm going to generalize about the British. Um, I, I, I know many British people. Uh, I have great regard for British people. I think this is probably um, an admirable trait of the British people. They are generally pretty risk averse. They are generally not particularly revolutionary. And in general, they're very orderly. Um, I, I had the, the, the privilege to live in Britain for a year. Um, and one of the things that I noticed, one of their specialties over there, they're very good at it, uh, they call it queuing, standing in line. Here in America, perhaps we're getting better, but I remember as, as, as a child, I, I mean, it, 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 sometimes lines are chaotic, but I remember as a child going to the supermarket with my mother, and uh, you never knew which line you should choose. And sometimes she would send me to stand in one line, and she would be 
in the other line, and if my line was going faster, she'd move the cart over to join me, and if hers was faster, she'd have me come join her. None of that in Britain. They have these wonderful compound lines, these queues as they call them. Everybody waits in the same line, and um, you know, the, the cashier, when, when he or she is free, says, um, I'll help the next available customer. You know, very orderly um, over in Britain. You wouldn't think that they would have a revolution, and certainly, certainly they wouldn't take it lightly. Um, overthrowing a monarch is not something that they did every day. And so um, they justified their revolution. They uh, took pains to underscore its legitimacy. And to do that, they turned to a man who, I, I think if you were going to construct a list of the, the top 10 most important people to live in the past 1,000 years, uh, he certainly would be on the list. Honestly, he might even be at the top. And of course, I'm referring to John Locke. John Locke, uh, in his two treatises of government, laid out what is the rightful purpose of government. And to uh, construct this theory, he um, imagined the state of nature. Way back uh, in the land of cavemen, way back before there's any society, um, a place that in, in many ways is, is sort of like Outback Steakhouse. No rules, just rights, right? <laughs> um, there were no rules in the state of nature. You could get up when you wished, you could go to bed when you wished, uh, you could do whatever you wanted. There was perfect freedom. And it's, it's a really important observation that, that Locke is making here. He, he also said that, that, of course, people have rights in the state of nature because rights don't come from governments. Rights, he said, come from God. Or rights, you could say, come from the essence of our humanity. I mean, just, just sort of consider uh, the human anatomy. We all have one brain. We are designed to think for ourselves. We, we've been given legs with which we are designed to walk about freely. We're, we're given hands with which we can work. Locke said, well, how do you establish property rights in the state of nature? Um, he said, you, you mix your labor with nature. You chop down a tree and build a hut, well, that's your hut. You take a branch and turn it into a, a spear to go fishing, well, that is your spear. So we, we have the lives that are naturally ours, that have give, been given to us by God. We have the liberty that has been given to us by God. And we have the right of property, which we have established for ourselves through our work. So what a wonderful place this is. You have rights. You have freedom. There's only one problem. The problem is you don't have perfect safety. You don't have perfect security. Because maybe you worked really hard fashioning yourself a spear. Or maybe you worked very hard building yourself a hut. The cave was very dreary and drafty and cold. What if some barbarian comes by? A barbarian who has a bigger club or a bigger spear than you do. What's to stop him from taking what is yours? What's to stop him from taking your property? Or worse, what's to stop him from enslaving you or kidnapping you? What's to stop him from killing you and taking away your life? Locke said what, what, what people did in the state of nature is they, they, they formed alliances with one another. They banded together to protect themselves against those who would transgress their rights. And so uh, people are going to come together and there is going to be some notion of reciprocity. If, if I'm going to stick my neck out and, and risk my life, for, for you and your rights, then, then, then you're going to do that for me. And this, Locke said, this is the origin of society. Ultimately, this is the origin of government. This is the purpose of government, to protect individual rights. The right not to have your life taken away from you.
the right not to have your liberty taken away from you, the right not to have your property taken away from you. And of course, Locke said, you know, you could imagine uh, a generation or two later after the formation of one of these alliances that one of its members' grandchildren might rise up and declare herself the empress, right? Or declare himself the king and usurp power and start to use that power to take away the very rights that government is constructed initially to protect. What then do the people have the right to do, John Locke said. Let me ask you, any ideas? Oh, no, remember he's British. <laughs> they have the right to petition. They have the right to complain. They have the right to protest. But if after repeated petitions, repeated protests, the government continues not to protect individual rights, but to take them away, what then do the people have the right to do? Then they have the right to have a revolution. So you can see how this philosophy is, is relevant not only to the people of 1688, it's also relevant to the people of 1776. But there's a date that I should also highlight, and that is 1763. 1763, of course, is the end of the French and Indian War, the end of the Seven Years' War, as it's also known. And no one would have predicted that people in America, just a dozen years hence, would be looking to declare their independence. People in America were proud to be British. People in America stepped forward to help the British fight here in North America, the French, as well as Native Americans, who were the allies largely of the French. There's a historian who's written a book about Massachusetts in the French and Indian War. By his estimation, more than a third of the men of military age in Massachusetts actually put on uniforms, left the colony of Massachusetts, and went off to fight in the French and Indian War. This is an incredible degree of mobilization. And there's no reason to suspect that there was anything special about Massachusetts. It's just that we have especially good records for Massachusetts. Americans weren't sitting and watching the British fight for control of this continent. They were helping the British do that. And of course, their colonial assemblies were putting forth funds in support of the American troops who were helping the British. And those colonial assemblies and their members were proud to be British in America. It was great to be British. It was probably better to be British in America. Britain at that point was not only the most powerful, not only the most prosperous, but also the freest nation on the planet. And the only place where people were more prosperous, the only place where people were more free was America. Flash forward a dozen years and read some of the diaries of British soldiers who come here during the War for Independence, and they are astounded by how well Americans live. They are astounded by the size of their houses. They are astounded by the, 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 the bounty that surrounds them. This is a, a, a really great place to be. And Americans attribute that to their English liberties. They attribute that to the, the, the benevolent government of the empire, which has treated them for generations with a sort of benign neglect. It has allowed them to develop their own autonomy. It has allowed them to govern themselves under the auspices of these miniature parliaments. And at this moment, this moment of great pride for Americans, this great pride in being British, the British begin to snatch defeat 
from the jaws of victory. The great irony of the French and Indian War, which of course the British and the Americans win, they drive the French out of North America. All of the land between the Atlantic Ocean all the way up to the Mississippi River is now part of Great Britain. One of the great ironies is that this war for empire sows the seeds that will bloom with the loss of the British Empire in almost all of North America. How does it happen? It's, it's easy to put yourself in the shoes of British parliamentarians. When they looked at the aftermath of the French and Indian War, they noted a, a couple of things. One is that between 1754 when it began and 1763 when it ended, Britain's debt doubled. And in 1763, if they had consulted with their account books, which it seems they did, they would note that in terms of total revenue from Britain's North American colonies, they received only 1,600 pounds. Now, I have to say, uh, probably like you, I, I'm, I'm very bad at, at guessing what the value of a pound was in 1763, but I have a comparative number for you. What they received from the colonies was 1,600 pounds, what they spent on the colonies was 384,000 pounds. So you, you can imagine, from the, from the British perspective, what they would want to do at the end of the French and Indian War. The first thing they would want to do is they would want to avoid future expensive wars in North America. And while the French had been uh, ejected from this continent, their Native American allies remained. And of course, there was going to be an almost natural friction between English settlers and Native Americans because English settlers, on average, um, were having families with eight children. The, the, the size of the English-speaking North American population doubled every 20 years. We were spreading across this continent. And the only way the British believed to prevent future wars with the Native Americans was essentially to draw a line. To draw a line down the middle of their North American empire and say the eastern half is for English-speaking settlers and the western half is reserved for Native Americans. And this line which, which ran along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains was known as the Proclamation Line of 1763. It was designed to create a buffer zone, to keep these populations separate, to prevent future expensive wars. And yet, you could also be sympathetic with the perspective of American settlers. Were you to look at a map of where the French and Indian War took place, much of it happened in what they then called the back country, in the Ohio Valley, around the Great Lakes. In other words, this was a land uh, that had be begun to be settled by English-speaking um, British North Americans. This was a land where people who lived on the frontier oftentimes saw their villages attacked and destroyed by Native Americans. These are people who were engaged in the thick of battle. These were people who had sacrificed for Britain. These were people who had sacrificed and, 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 and some of them suffered great losses to see the British flag fly on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. These are people who lost sons and fathers and brothers and limbs. And now their government, the British government, was drawing a, an arbitrary line and saying that even though this was part of Britain, this land west of the Appalachian Mountains. Even though they were British, even though they were victorious, the British government was siding with their enemies. And if this wasn't enough to begin to alienate the British North American colonists, in 1765, Parliament passed the Stamp Act. It's almost as if uh, members of Parliament were all issued one of those books. Um, you know, you see them in the bookstore. Uh, title would be something like, How to Lose an Empire for Dummies. 
because they created a, a law that was not only extremely odious, but also repugnant to a, a, a broad array of important constituencies. The Stamp Act mandated that a, a stamp, I mean literally a stamp, had to be affixed to all sorts of different things that were uh, printed. And so, you know, if you were in Parliament and you were thinking, somewhat perversely, how, how should we unite the Americans, who up to this point had been um, really regionally divided, People from Massachusetts didn't have much to do with people from Pennsylvania. People with, from Pennsylvania didn't have much to do with people from Virginia. People from Virginia didn't have much to do with people from South Carolina. And they were happy to keep it that way. What better way to unite the colonies as a group? What better way to unite different groups in society within each colony than to pass this law? Um, it alienated all sorts of different uh, important constituencies. Uh, if you really wanted to fire people up against you, you might go after first the lawyers. Because then, and I, I, I'll let you tell me if I'm wrong, but then as now, lawyers as an occupational group are, are probably overrepresented in assemblies. So let's go after the lawyers and let's mandate that all legal documents have to bear the stamp. Now lawyers have to deal with, with you know, the, the red tape, the hassle of, of dealing with this, this, this revenue and, and passing it on to some government official. Of course, the stamp has a cost, so it makes it more expensive for lawyers to do business and increases the price of their services. It makes it more difficult for people to afford their services, so they do less business. And uh, you know, if we're going to go after the colonists, let's go after the merchants as well, all paper products will bear the stamp. Same phenomenon. And of course, if we want to alienate the colonies, we should certainly target uh, the press. Let's mandate that newspapers have to bear the stamp. They become more expensive. This, this you know, uh, tedious uh, and burdensome regulation is placed upon uh, members of the media. Newspapers are more expensive and therefore people can afford to buy fewer of them. Let's not forget that on Sundays, especially, members of the clergy are important. Even the Bible and, and marriage licenses had to bear the stamp. And just so we don't want, we don't want to you know, make them feel left out, um, academics, professors are probably not very important, but they at least like to feel important. So let's, uh, let's mandate that the stamp has to appear on college diplomas as well. Oh, and we left one out, one group out. We want to uh, alienate uh, drunk, rowdy mobs. So, so let's mandate that the stamp has to appear on packages of dice and playing cards. Americans united in protest against the Stamp Act. They uh, demonstrated, they boycotted, they petitioned. They organized committees of correspondence. They networked with people in other colonies. And finally, Great Britain, and again, they're following uh, the rules laid out in How to Lose an Empire for Dummies. Um, if you see bad behavior, do you reward it or do you punish it? Well, if you don't want to condition it, you punish it. But what do the British do? They reward it. They repeal the Stamp Act. So Americans have learned a valuable lesson. If the British Parliament does something that we don't like, we're going to band together. We're going to protest, boycott, petition, and win. And this happens again. In 1767, the British government passes the Townsend Duties. Like the, uh, the Stamp Act, really pretty repugnant. Uh, a set of taxes on products like lead, glass, paint, paper, and tea. And uh, there were a couple things that made this uh, especially upsetting for the colonists. The first, like the Stamp Act, is that the colonies, they didn't have representatives in parliament. They didn't elect people who spoke for them. Without representation in parliament, Parliament is, is essentially 
when it taxes them, it's reaching into their pockets without asking and taking from them. Now, I know we live in a time of moral relativism, but let me just put it out to you. What, what's, what's a word that we might use to describe when someone reaches into your pocket and takes your money without asking? What would you call that? Yeah. Stealing, you know? They have no representation. They have no, uh, uh, there's no accountability in parliament to the people of America. As far as they're concerned, this is out and out theft. I mean, think about what's been happening. The, the proclamation line of 1763, that takes away their liberty. They can't even move within their own country. The Stamp Act, the Townsend duties, this is the government confiscating their property and they have no recourse. These are things that the government is, is supposed to protect against. And yet, it's the British government itself that is violating these rights. The Townsend duties are uh, repugnant for a number of other reasons. The, uh, the money that, they, that used to pay the salaries of the royal governors who were appointed by the crown, that money used to come from the colonists themselves. That money used to be paid by the various colonial assemblies, by the colonial legislatures. Now that money would come from London and it would be funded by the revenues from the towns and duties. In other words, the leverage that the colonial legislatures used to have over these royal governors. If we don't like your performance, we won't pay you. That leverage is now gone. Well, again, the colonists rose up. Again, they networked. Again, they protested. Again, they petitioned. Again, they boycotted. And again, the British government, reading out of its uh, manual, rewarded this behavior by repealing the Townsend duties. It repealed the Townsend duties on a day that members of parliament hoped would, would always live on in the annals of, of Anglo-American friendship and brotherhood. March 5th, 1770. And yet, we don't remember March 5th, 1770 as the date of the repeal of the Townsend duties. We remember it for another event. An event that took place on a cold Monday night in Boston. A poor British soldier, um, he and his, his comrades, we'd call them peacekeeping troops nowadays, but a poor British soldier who'd been stationed uh, in, in, in Boston, he was given the unenviable task of, of standing guard outside of the most hated building in all of Boston, the Custom House, where the tax collectors worked. And as he stood there on this dark, cold, icy night, a number of little children gathered and they started to taunt him and they started to throw snowballs and then pieces of ice and sticks and stones and and he began to get a little worried so he called for reinforcements he called uh you know for other guards to join him and there they are with their backs against the wall of the customs house and then something really kind of incredible happened and to this date we don't know how this happened why this happened who coordinated this, if it was coordinated, as it appears to be. But all the church bells in Boston started to ring. And if all the church bells in Boston started to ring, on a Monday night, it was usually a sign of some horrible public alarm. It was a, it was a, a call to the people to come out of doors, aid your neighbors. There's some sort of horrible calamity taking place. And in the 18th century, um, in an age where everything was made of wood, what was the calamity that people feared more than any other? Fire, right? So there's perhaps a big fire taking place. Well, people come out of doors and they, they gather in the center of Boston. They end up gathering right in front of the customs house. And here's the scene with the soldiers with their backs against the wall. And now it's not just children taunting the soldiers. It's also members of this mob. And the soldiers, they're, they're, they're almost panicked at this point. They have their, their, their muskets um, you know, uh, aim, aiming toward the crowd. They have their bayonets fixed. The people in the front of the crowd, they don't want 
to, to be pushed into, these, into the points of these bayonets, so they push back. And yet the people in the back of the crowd, people in the back of this revolutionary mosh pit, right? They push forward. And it's pandemonium, and it's dark, and it's crowded, and people are shouting, and they're yelling, and the bells are ringing, and the bells are ringing, and that's a sign of what? Fire, someone says. And one of the British soldiers does. And then the rest do. And this, this is called the Boston Massacre. Now we know that really it's the Boston unfortunate incident. It's a Boston misunderstanding. But as far as Americans were concerned, when they looked at the accounts that were propagated by members of the Sons of Liberty, when they looked at the engraving that was reproduced by Paul Revere, showing not the British soldiers with their backs against the wall, but the American crowd with its back against the wall. When they showed not someone in the crowd yelling fire, but instead the British captain with his sword raised, clearly giving the command to uh, let loose on the colonists. As far as Americans outside of Boston were concerned, if the proclamation line had taken away their liberty, if the Stamp Act and the Townsend duties had taken away their property, now their own government now the British government had sent troops to America who were now taking away their lives. All of the things that government was supposed to protect now were under attack by government. Fast forward three years to 1773. The British uh, have levied attacks on tea. And colonists have been very good at boycotting tea, at resisting the temptation to buy British tea. They've been uh, substituting um, black market tea. They've been substituting sort of, I call them pregnancy teas. It's what my wife drank when, when our, our, our kids were, uh, were, were born, but herbal teas. And yet the British, they thought they figured out a way to uh, foil this American um, refusal to consume taxed British tea. The British government decided to keep the tax on the tea, but to subsidize it so that it was incredibly inexpensive, so that it cost less than the black market tea, so that it cost less than the herbal tea. And this was good British tea. And these Americans were still good British tea drinkers. On the one hand, was the principle of refusing to consume, refusing to purchase any product that was taxed by a parliament in which they had no representation. On the other hand, this is really, on the other quivering hand, this is good British tea. Americans doubted even their own capacity for virtue, even their own resolve, even their own ability to stare down this temptation. So after uh, meeting together at the Old South Meeting House in Boston, Americans briefly went home. The men stripped off their shirts, uh, smeared their, their bodies with uh, soot and paint, put feathers in their hair, dressed up as Mohawk Indians, and went to Griffin's Wharf, where they encountered ships named the Dartmouth, the Beaver, and the, uh, and the uh, I'm missing, I'm, I'm, the, El the Eleanor, thank you. And there they board these three ships. And there they dumped 90,000 pounds. That's in terms of weight, not value. 90,000 pounds worth of tea into Boston Harbor. They were very careful too, I should note, only to destroy the tea. They didn't want to destroy anything else. And they certainly didn't want to steal the tea. These were people doing revolutionary things, but they had rules under which they operated. An elderly man was seen stuffing tea into his pockets, and he was stripped naked by the crowd and sent home in disgrace. The people who threw the tea into uh, Griffin's Wharf 
had to smash padlocks to get into the cargo holds of these ships. The next day, the masters of these vessels were presented with new padlocks. The British government, which had previously indulged the American colonists, which had previously rewarded what from its perspective must have been bad behavior, this time did just the opposite. This time the British government shocked and appalled Americans by passing a set of laws that the British government called, like this is their spin, they called them the Coercive Acts. Would you name a law the Coercive Acts? <laughs> and we called them what they were to us, the Intolerable Acts. The Intolerable Acts shut down Boston Harbor. The Intolerable Acts outlawed the meeting of the Massachusetts Assembly. The Intolerable Acts even shut down local town meetings. In other words, the people of Massachusetts had lost a fundamental English right, the right to govern oneself. We weren't being treated like Englishmen anymore. Some people said the English were treating Americans like Irishmen, <laughs> like an occupied people. Others said that the English were treating Americans like slaves. Patrick Henry in 1774, shortly after the passage of the Intolerable Acts said this, we are in a state of nature. In other words, we no longer have a government, certainly not a government that does the things that government legitimately can do. We don't have a government that is protecting our rights. We don't have a government that's protecting our liberty. It's taking our liberty away. We don't have a government that's taking our property that's protecting our property, it's taking our property away. We don't have a government that's taking, that's protecting our lives. It's taking our lives away. And of course, the British, now nearing the conclusion of their book, How to Lose an Empire for Dummies. The British decide these colonists, and it's really interesting because in the 1760s you have radical people like Sam Adams or James Otis who say that there's a conspiracy, there's a plot, the British government is conspiring to take away our freedom. The British actions turn these people who are viewed as, as eccentrics, as extremists, as nuts, they turn them into prophets. One of the last chapters of How to Lose an Empire is march your troops out past Lexington to Concord and take away the weapons that they have for the defense and preservation of their liberties. And in April 1775, this is what the British do. And it's funny that we should remember, um, as we do, we remember Lexington and Concord you know, as sort of like the first battle of the war for independence. I mean, I suppose if you wanted to, you could just remember the Battle of Lexington, but I think we don't, um, and it's probably, you know, all for the best that we don't, because uh, at Lexington we lose. At Lexington, you know, the British start to fire, and essentially Americans run away. It's at Concord that we make our stand at the Old North Bridge. It's at Concord that only after, you, you couldn't quite see what the action was taking place, but off in the distance, in the heart of town, the Americans saw um, smoke billowing it up toward the sky. They thought that the British was burning down their village. The British actually were just burning um, some military supplies. But thinking that their own homes were under attack, that's where Americans found their resolve. That's where Americans decided to really fight back. And that's where Americans turned back the British, turned them back toward Boston. And on this 18-mile stretch of road between Concord and Boston, 
Here is where you see one, uh, some of the few actual examples of Americans um, firing at British troops from trees or behind stone fences. And here Americans, uh, if they didn't before, now they, they, they knew for sure the British were coming. They were coming back and they were ready. And Americans of all uh, types, Americans of all ages were ready. And one of my, my favorites is an 80-year-old man from Monotomy, Massachusetts named Samuel Wedemore. He lived there on that road. He knew the British would be coming back. And this time, he was going to be ready. A veteran of the French and Indian War, he uh, armed himself with a number of different things. He had his musket, he had two pistols, and he had a sword that he had confiscated from the dead body of a French soldier he had slain more than a decade earlier. And he hid behind a stone fence. And when he saw the redcoats, the lobsterbacks, as they were called, coming down the road, he loaded his musket and he fired. And he took out one British soldier. And then he fired again, and he took out a second. At this point, the British soldiers are, you know, they're looking around nervously, where is this gunfire coming from? And they spot him behind the stone fence. And the British troops rush the fence. Meanwhile, Samuel Wenamore has his first pistol. And he shoots, and he takes out another British soldier. And his second pistol, and he shoots, and he takes out yet another British soldier. And, and now the British soldiers have mounted the fence, and they're on top of him, this 80-year-old man. And as he flails about with his sword, they stab him with their bayonets. And this is a true story. And, and, and yet, it, all the details are they're just so awesome. How many times, just to make it a great story, would they stab this man? How about one for each colony? 13 times he's stabbed by the British soldiers and they leave him for dead. But you know what? He doesn't die. 80 year old Samuel Wedemore lives. He lives for another 18 years <laughs> to die a free citizen, a free 98 year old citizen of an independent United States of America. And it's a true story. His wife, 76-year-old Faith Wedemore, was on the second floor taking out British soldiers with her crossbow. <laughs> All right, that part isn't true. <laughs> but it gives a sense of the degree to which Americans were willing to stand up and fight for their rights, the degree to which Americans were willing to stand up and fight for their liberties. Of course, this is April 1775. It wasn't until July 4th, 1776, that finally the Continental Congress came around to actually declaring independence. And there in the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson restated Lockean principles. He restated what these new governments, the new governments of these new states, would be devoted to protecting. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here's a part that's a little bit less famous, but perhaps even more important, the line that follows immediately thereafter, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. In other words, the purpose of government, the end of government, is the protection of these rights. And then the process of government, you know, deciding how to protect these rights, that's where we turn to representative government. That's where we turn toward democracy. And those are the pillars of legitimacy. Jefferson restated his principles, American principles, on yet another occasion, long after the war for independence had been won, long after the Constitution had been ratified. On March 4th, 1801, as Jefferson stood in the newly constructed chambers 
in the new capital of the United States in Washington, D.C., and delivered his inaugural address. He reflected on all the great advantages that America possessed. He reflected on the wonderful resources. He reflected on the wonderful people. He asked the people in the audience, he said, with all of this, with all these blessings, what's left to close the circle of our felicities? One thing more, he said, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. In, in many respects, Washington, D.C. in 1801 is uh, light years from Washington, D.C. in 2012, or even the site of my, my final, final story, Philadelphia in 2008. I was there with my wife, my two kids. Um, I have a son who's, my wife and I met at Monticello. My son's name is Jefferson. Uh, our daughter, we almost named her Madison, but that, we thought, even we thought that would be carrying a bit far. Our daughter's name is Grace. And uh, we had a wonderful day in Philadelphia. We toured all the sites. We went to Independence Hall. Uh, we went to the Betsy Ross house. We had uh, dinner at the City Tavern. And afterwards, uh, my son Jefferson, he was three at the time. Uh, you know, he's a great kid. Back then, he was really into Bob the Builder. Um, and wherever he went, he carried around a Bob the Builder toolkit. Had a little saw and little hammer, little chainsaw. Um, Jefferson really wanted to see the Liberty Bell. So, uh, you know, we, we went to the Liberty Bell Pavilion, and uh, wouldn't you know, it was just about to close. We were the last people through security, the last people to be let inside. And uh, we walked up toward the bell, and there was a nice uh, park ranger there. And he heard me speaking with my son, and he was impressed, the park ranger, that my son's name was Jefferson. And then we started talking, and uh, he heard that I, I was a, a history professor who who studied the revolution. Um, so he really warmed up to us and he, he sort of leaned forward um, and he almost half whispered to me, he said, do you want me to let him touch the bell? <laughs> and, and I had two thoughts. My first thought was, is this how our federal government preserves our precious historical resources? <laughs> and my second was, heck yes. <laughs> and so he lifted the cord and Jefferson was able to go forward and he was able to just touch very gently, gingerly, the Liberty Bell. And afterwards, he was actually kind of concerned because he had noticed that the Liberty Bell had a crack. <laughs> and he said to me, it's cracked, Daddy, it's cracked. And then he said, I'll fix it. I'll fix it with my tools. <laughs> and it strikes me that all of us have tools that can allow us to repair and preserve and protect liberty. It strikes me that the Heartland Institute provides us with tools that we could use for that purpose. It strikes me that many of you have especially powerful tools that can be dedicated to that cause. So for your service and the protection of liberty, I want to say thank you all very, very much. Uh, yeah, if there are any questions, we can take a couple questions, um, and then we'll kind of just try to flag down Kendall in the back, walking around. Uh, I've, I've heard it said that uh, during the War for Independence that roughly one-third of the American colonists supported uh, independence from Britain, uh, Britain one-third supported the British crown, and one-third sat on the fence. Is there any uh, validity to that uh, guesstimation? <laughs> 
I think that's a pretty pretty valid guesstimation. The source uh, who you heard that from is John Adams. It was John Adams who said that in 1776. Um, and it's probably fair to say that uh, as, as the war progressed, um, the number of loyal, loyalists decreased. Uh, the number of people in favor of independence uh, grew. The number of loyalists decreased for a couple reasons. Um, one, a lot of loyalists left what, what we were then calling the United States. Um, also, a lot of people who thought they were loyalists were, were alienated by the British Army. Um, the, the, the British Army, I mean, these were guys who really need to go take a Dale Carnegie course. Because um, they, they were very bad at making friends. And they were good at influencing people, but they influenced people um, to, to oppose them. Um, they were very heavy-handed with the civilian population. Um, they, uh, they committed atrocities, probably not quite on the order of that movie from about 10 years ago, The Patriot. I mean, they didn't uh, lock people in churches and burn them down, but they, they did some awful things. And uh, I think, you know, the war was not only a war of battles, it really was a war for hearts and minds. And the British uh, army was, was very, they were good at, at occupying cities, they were pretty good at winning battles, and they were very bad at, at winning hearts and minds. Uh, I don't really have a question, I have a comment that I think you'll appreciate after hearing that your son is named Jefferson, uh, my granddaughter is named Madison, and my grandson is named Reagan. And uh, <laughs> my son, who is running to join me in the North Dakota legislature, says that he named his children after two great presidents, the father of the Constitution and the last one that paid any attention to it. <laughs> I had a question. Um, historically, where would you pinpoint the beginning of this uh, concept of collectivism in the United States? If you were to try to pinpoint it from a historical perspective, where, did, where would you say really that was the origination of the concept? Uh, sadly, and, and to the great detriment of uh, the American colonies, collectivism was present at the very origins of our founding. It was present in Jamestown in 1607. It was present in Plymouth in 1620. Um, and what I mean is uh, both of those, and they were private enterprises, by the way, um, that, that funded these expeditions. And the, the, the leaders of these private em enterprises, these joint stock companies, had, had determined that they wanted the colonists to be working primarily for the benefit of the, of the company, not for their own benefit. And so um, when they arrived, people weren't assigned private property. They weren't assigned their own um, lots for growing food, for example. And so all of the farming was collectivized, and people were expected to go out into the field, uh, and they were all going to contribute equally in terms of work for growing the crops. And, they were all going to contribute. They're all going to receive equally from the, the bounty of the harvest that would result. Well, you you know what happened? They starved to death. I mean, they 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 literally starved to death. In the first few years at Jamestown, the British sent over um, originally sixty or seventy people. Only about twenty survived. They tried to resupply the colony. They sent another five hundred settlers over, and after the the horrible starving winters of sixteen o nine and sixteen ten. Of the 500 who they had sent over, only 60 survived. And we have authentic examples of cannibalism in Jamestown. So collectivism almost destroyed America before it even began. And even in, 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 in Plymouth, even in this society that was um, devoted uh, less toward profit and more toward creating, as John Winthrop said, a, a city on a hill that would be a, a great example um, to the people of old England. You know, they would all want to emulate new and improved England. But before new and improved England uh, even got off the ground, the same thing happened. And it was only after Governor Bradford decided to carve up land into three-acre lots and make people responsible for growing their own food. It was only then that the starvation um, uh, came to an end. And one last question. Professor, I'm Art Wittick from Montana. Um, you're a historian, and, but I also assume you're a student of current affairs. Our, our excellent speaker this morning mentioned that the country is uh, 
kind of in a reawakening and, and characterize it as the second American Revolution. Um, yet, you talk about your son Jefferson, and I have a daughter, Madison. Um, um, do you think that this American fiber of ours, do you, do you think that it's the second American Revolution, or would you believe it to be just a continuation of our culture that we're yearning for that, um, for that sense of freedom now? Uh, or do you think that there was this period of, of absence and all of a sudden now there's a reawakening? Hey, it's a great question, um, and I thank you for it. I mean, by the way, I should stipulate something if it's not obvious enough. I'm, I'm uh, required, I'm on leave time right now, and I'm required to specify that my views do not necessarily represent those of the United States government or any of its components. <laughs> and having said that, having said that, I'll say, I'll say this. I, I hope not. I mean, I, I hope that we've retained um, our, our stuff, you know? Thomas Jefferson was excited uh, to see the beginnings of the French Revolution, but it also filled him with trepidation because he thought, frankly, the French, they had lived in such poverty. They, have lived, they had lived with, without freedom um, for so long that they really, what they really needed w were training wheels. He, he thought the best the French could hope for was some sort of constitutional monarchy like what Britain had. That it took a special kind of people to really be able to, uh, to, to take responsibility for their own freedom, to truly govern themselves, govern themselves individually as well as when necessary, govern themselves collectively. And he thought Americans could do that because Americans, by and large, they owned their own land. Americans, by and large, they were, were capable of, of providing for themselves and for their families. They were, they were independent. They didn't rely on each other. That's not to say that they were isolated uh, hermits who were not part of communities, far from it. Uh, most Americans were farmers. They were literally rooted in the soil. They had a vested interest in their communities. They had a vested interest in protecting their reputations. They had a vested interest in seeing the community flourish and thrive. All these things, Jefferson thought, gave America tremendous advantages and made the American people particularly well-equipped to handle the, the burden of self-government. As we lose some of those qualities, community spirit, independence, self-reliance, as that happens, I think it, it probably makes sense to feel more anxious about our ability to shoulder the burdens um, of the liberty that, that we're really blessed to have. Okay, thank you very much.